and welcome to the Practical Animal channel. My next guest is Dave Sharp. Dave runs two businesses. One is Icarus Falconry, and for that he takes on private guests to give them experiences with birds of prey. His other business is Raptor Exotics, and his activities include going around schools with animals that include reptiles to give talks on various aspects of natural history and conservation. Dave Sharp, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me on your channel. Great, I look forward to our chat. That's an absolute pleasure, Dave. First of all, can you tell us about this fantastic animal that I can see? Okay, well, it's chosen at random, chosen at random from our Raptor Exotics, sort of exotics room. Now, Raptor Exotics as a business is all run from home because it's all off site. So basically I have a, a separate building that houses the animals for that, as well as a collection of birds of prey. And this guy was chosen at random. I don't even see him on there. He's a really beautiful species. It's a black headed python, python from Australia. And why have I got this snake is, is always something that I have to ask myself because when I started this business 11 years ago, obviously it would be very easy to fill that animal room with all the animals that I haven't yet kept or things I used to love from my childhood and get carried away with keeping things that I love. And of course it's a business. It needs to be animals that fit into that business. And that's always been the hard thing, obviously separating your heart from your head. <laughs> One of the topics is Australian animals. Now, Australian animals are unusual because unlike most animals when I was younger, they can't actually be legally imported. So although we captive breed most of the animals we work with nowadays, when, when I was when we was a kid, you, you remember the same as me, everything was caught from the wild. All the exotic animals, if you wanted a tarantula or an iguana or a royal python from Africa, they were all wild caught. Um, and obviously there has to be wild caught animals to produce captive bred animals, but we're lucky now we live in a time where they're all captive bred. So those wild caught animal days are pretty much long gone and we work with captive bred animals. But the Australian animals, Australia has never, le never legally allowed any animals to leave its shores ever. So technically all the Australian animals that don't also live in Indonesia were smuggled out of the country. Some, someone somewhere smuggled them out of the country. And of course, that can put a high value on those animals because they're so hard to get. They're, they could be worth a lot of money. And if they're a rare or unusual species, that's putting a strain on the on the native population because if they look at the rhino, if things are worth enough money, people will take them whatever, won't they, with no, no thought to conservation. So these are captive bred black-headed pythons. It's, it's a great python to talk specifically for my Australian topic. And secondly, I actually have a pair of these which we're growing on which we'll endeavour to breed. And again, although they're not particularly rare in the wild, captive breeding has many facets of being a conservation effort, very many facets. One is, if you can commercially breed animals in captivity for the pet market, it takes away the wild pressure. And we can talk about that at school as well, how breeding animals in captivity, such as these, fits in with a, a type of conservation. Many faceted thing, isn't it, conservation, you know? Um, the one of the things that we try and do during our interviews is we try and gain an insight into what it takes to work with animals, the personal qualities necessary in a person, the person, the skills necessary for people who are perhaps animal management students at land-based colleges or undergraduates of the biological sciences or indeed anybody who perhaps fancies a career change and works with animals. So the questions I'll be asking you Dave are connected along those lines. So uh, what we want is as much insight as you can provide. What was the name of the snake again? What species? It's a black-headed python. Black-headed python from Australia. 
Yeah, classically renowned for having a very sort of camouflage pattern body, maybe, but a head that looks like it's been dipped in black ink. I don't know if you can see how glossy and black and very unusually contrasting to the rest of its pattern here. Uh, they actually do look like a couple of the venomous Australian snakes, and whether it's partly to do with sort of mimicry, I'm not entirely sure, but they certainly do look like a couple of the venomous Australian snakes. So maybe that's why, but I don't know why other than that they've got this pattern. And they're also very unpython-like. They're not big and bulky like your classic python. They're what we call a sort of like, a, they're like a colubrid, a sort of more normal snake, a classic snake. So very unusual, very beautiful, and importantly for work, a story to tell. Yeah, she's an absolutely beautiful animal. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, found only in Australia or Australia and Indonesia? Yeah, most, mostly in the Northern Territories of Australia, quite arid regions, really. Um, obviously, we say Australia like it's England, like it's another country, but, you know, it's the size of a European continent, isn't it, really? You know, so they have such a varied wildlife because they have such a massively varying habitats across Australia. So very lucky people. If you like snakes, there in Southeast Asia. Tell me about the status of it in the wild, Jay, please. Is it endangered, common? No, not particularly threatened or endangered. So no, it's, it's, they're doing okay. Many of the snakes in Australia actually live in such remote regions that they don't have a great deal of data on them. Dave, you have two animal businesses. Can you tell us, please, how did you get into those businesses? Okay, I'm gonna try and shorten a really long life story here. <laughs> so I've always kept and been fascinated in animals. I've been catching creepy crawlies and bugs since I could probably walk, you know, a lifelong interest in nature. Um, I it almost accidentally got into falconry when I was a sort of a late teenager. So I become, that took over my whole life as well, but always as an interest, a passion or a hobby. Um, now I know you've lived abroad because you've told me so, but we, we've moved our uh, family to, the, to a rural part of Spain for a couple of years. And we returned for various reasons. And one of the main reasons was my wife's always wanted to be a nurse. And although we spoke reasonable Spanish, never to a degree level of Spanish that she could learn and practice that there. Um, we, we changed our lives back around. We came home. My wife studied to be a nurse and now she's a high level nurse. She's a manager, you know, so she's realized the dream. But I didn't really want to come back. I was living in a Spanish countryside. There were reptiles there. There were birds of prey there. Way more than we get here. You know, it's quite depressing coming back. And I thought, I don't want to fall back into my old lifestyle. What can I do that, that's about what I love? You know, I want to do something I love. And I look at other people, as I'm sure you have actually, that, that work with animals in different contexts. And especially if they're working with the public, they often talk utter rubbish. And especially with children, they think, oh, those children don't know anything. I'm getting paid. I'll talk rubbish. And it's sort of cringeworthy. And I thought, you know what? I'll put my money where my mouth is. And I'll develop a business along those lines. So the business Raptor Exotics was all aimed at school education. And we do off-site events. We've done children's parties and things. But, but the core business was, was school education. And in the summer holidays and the holidays, I then ran falconry displays around and, and about, as maybe you have, I don't know, but around the country, off-site events with falconry. And that also helped fill in using the animals I used for schools, birds of prey as well. But it filled in that summer Sort of lag of, of no school work um it's a business that's built from nothing literally from nothing i did have a good leg up from a friend who originally ran a chris falconry and said any school visits that come in we'll put them your way and you know so that was great it's always good to have a leg up and it's not what you know it's who you know isn't it you know um and it's a business that for a decade grew exponentially and i was turning work away before coronavirus hit desperately waiting for my daughter Georgia to finish her zoology degree and take her on board, train her up how I work at schools so she could take some of that workload and, and develop her own, her own living, you know. If somebody was to say to you, Dave, what three things differentiate your businesses from other either bird of prey centres or public speakers visiting schools with animals. Do you have three things that separate you from other businesses? Well, yeah, I don't know which would be the best three things, but for sure. So we've got to look at them as two separate businesses. So just a quick rundown. So Raptor Exotics is aimed at school education, fitting in with nature-based topics. And 
Icarus Falconry, compared to most falconry centres where they're kind of a falconry zoo or a bird of prey zoo, and if you pay extra, you can maybe have some hands-on experience with one of the birds. Icarus Falconry, at the current time, isn't open as a zoo. It's purely hands-on experience days. So one thing that sets that aside is, you as an experienced day guest, you are not an extra way of us earning a bit of money. You are number one. There's no there's no public milling around, and we limit it to five or six people on any one day. So it's a really intimate. It's not one to one, but it, it nearly is. You know, I'm a very tiny group, and they can spend half a day, depending on which level of experience they've bought. It's an online purchase system. You get a voucher. It lasts you a year, and you can redeem that voucher and come and book your day in. And we run three sort of tiers, uh, a hawk and owl, a sort of a bottom of the run where most people would, would most people unlike us haven't had any experience. That's great. You know, they're going to get and fly for real, wild and free, different owls and probably go on a Harris Hawk walk or something like that. We run a slightly higher tier for people that maybe they've done that and they want to work with a bit more, maybe some larger owls. Maybe they want to fly some of our black kites free, maybe one of the eagles or one of the vultures. And then we run an eagle and vulture day, like as an elite day for those that have done everything. It's a little bit more expensive, but you're working with eagles and vultures throughout your thing. So the thing that makes that stand apart is it's 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 personal. It's not a zoo, and it's low key. And key to all of these things is your staff or yourself. Who's doing that work? It, it really is the key. Um, the biggest thing I found across both businesses that's really difficult is all the young people coming up that I know have got degrees in zoology or are just really good with animals, whether it's this kind of beastie or even falconry. It seems to go hand in hand. Animal Passionate animal people uh, aren't people people. I can find people to work for me that, oh my goodness, they're naturals at, at the animal care or, or training birds of prey but they can't do the front of house. And that is both businesses. And as I often say to the staff, the business is about people, not about birds or animals. That's the business because that's the people that are paying your wages and, and enabling us to conserve these animals or learn about them or keep them ourselves. So the key, the number one key thing to run in either business is people skills. What the personal qualities say? Does a person need them? So I think... I think any kind of work, you're, you're always going to achieve and have a job if you are honest. So honesty, reliability, again, in any job, reliability is that people skills, being able to impart your knowledge in a way that other people will absorb. And the way to do that, always with learning, is have fun. That's when you're absorbing knowledge. So you've got to make it fun. And you've got to be truthful, honest, but make this learning fun key thing for children the children's side of it raptor exotics obviously we don't allow people to stroke our birds of prey we know that's not good for them they don't mentally enjoy it and it's not good for their plumage but lower intelligence animals like creepy crawlies snakes and lizards as long as they're um can't think of the word but used to it it's not the word i'm looking for enabling children and adults i've got to tell you to touch and stroke a snake because you can tell them and swear blind that no snake is slimy and this snake's not going to hurt you but until they make contact you can see that that penny drop an allied question that i want to ask dave is apart from the qualities necessary to work with animals what are the skills necessary you talk about people skills could you expand please okay so i think people skills you know, you've got to be able to tell people no when they're about to do something that's inappropriate, but they're still your audience. So I see, I've see i seen people work with reptiles with an audience, and they're actually quite... They're, they're overly abrupt and forthright with people. They'll, they'll tell off people. Now, if you tell... Well, I don't like being told off, and I know I'm doing something wrong, and when my wife tells me off, I know I've done it right. I still don't like it. And, you know, you know the thing. So people don't like to be told off. But you've got to have the confidence. So you need to know your subject matter, experience of working with these animals so that the animals are calm. Birds of prey compared to reptiles and creepy crawlers are so very different. Finding people to work with birds of prey is so, so difficult. It, there's so much that can go wrong. The difficult thing with the falconry as a business 
if you're working with the public especially is you've really got to be good at the fulkery do you take on volunteers at the fulkery center we tend to because there's more to do and again volunteers on at the fulkery center and for decades it's run in conjunction or we've helped out the local agricultural college whether you're volunteering or getting paid or, or you're a business owner 95 percent of your job is picking up poo we've become a lot more picky on on choosing our volunteers another thing i always say which sounds so negative a volunteer is a humongous drain on my staff's resources my resources until they're at the point they're a good volunteer and they can crack on on their own so what do you look for in a potential volunteer i mean how do you ascertain qualities like potential loyalty or drive um I'm looking at someone with passion to drive that understands that it's a lot of graft for a little bit of fun. But if you're finding people that are then standing around corners, leaning on a rake very quickly from our point of view, the novelty is worn off with that person. Dave, moving slightly on, I always imagine that the day that somebody takes the plunge and starts their own business, the very next day, some kind of national emergency occurs. I always yeah. imagine that's like. So how has COVID affected you? Incredibly badly. <laughs> I can tell you now, across two businesses in two different local authorities, so they're, they're governed by different locals, both businesses, because they're not open to the public as a zoo, they still have to have um, an animals activities license to trade. It's, it's kind of like, three quarters of a zoo license, but less on, and less onus on the public safety to a degree, you're not having the crowds, but we have to put in place and abide by a licensing system, which costs money and time, obviously, to abide by. And unfortunately, neither business has been able to claim any government or council funding. We've got staff that I can't furlough because they're self-employed. So we've got staff that I can tell you now have worked most of this year for nothing. Because even in lockdown, when we're not allowed to have any customers through the doors, the business is exactly the same for us, isn't it? We, we don't take people out with the birds, but all the costs and the running and the animals and keeping the birds active and healthy, that just carries on going. It's demoralising. You've, you've got people, I'm working hard, you've got people working really hard for you to keep a team of birds of prey healthy and fit and clean. And it gets end of the month and you say, you know, it's lockdown, we still haven't got anywhere. It's, it's a lot of pressure. So you've got the mental strain on yourself. Yeah, COVID has took Raptor Exotics from a business in March that after 10 years had not only just about sorted out its debts for all the money you pay out when you roll up a new business, it, a business that is also turning work away. No self-employed person wants to turn work away. But you think, well, this is amazing. You know, I've, I've got to this stage, I'm working six or seven days a week across the board. And we can't do it all. And that's, that's a great feeling to know you've got that far. So overnight, overnight, pretty much no work at schools for the whole year. I've actually done, if I added up, I've actually done since much three weeks worth of school for 2020 instead of being in schools every single day that schools are open. We've got through nearly a year of this rubbish. Let's just keep wading through the mud. And I'm sure when things come out the other side, we're just going to be like the phoenix a lot of debt, like back to the beginning, but we're going to rise up and the work's going to build up because I know those schools are desperate to get people in to teach their kids some real hands-on stuff about nature. And again, at the Fulcry Centre, people are desperate to go outside in the countryside and have a great time. And I know our customers will come flooding back to spend a day flying birds of prey with us. But for now, yes, it's destroyed the businesses and they're just hanging on and treading water, for sure. Having animal businesses Dave, and continuing with this theme of having taken the plunge and having started businesses with animals, how you have a bird of prey centre as well. Uh, recently, we've had bird flu arrive on our shores. How has that affected the birds of prey? So, towards the end of 2020, friends and people saying to me, well, you know, it can't get any worse, can it? And I just want to poke them in the eye. Don't say, you never say things like you. So I'll talk about tempting fate. And sure enough, at the end of the most difficult year ever, bird flu comes along. 
Now, bird flu is going to be with us every single winter. It's brought here by migratory birds. We, we can't stop birds migrating from the continent to England. It's never going to go away. It's been a particularly bad strain this year. Um, massively impacted us initially because initially no birds were allowed out of their aviaries and we weren't allowed to have guests even when there was no lockdown. Yes, we can start welcoming guests in. You can't go out with the birds. Fortunately, uh, DEFRA or whoever of, of the government have basically given us license or the, the sort of free license to exercise our birds. Um, it's changed what we do. So as a falconry perspective, falconers in the UK now, their season's been ruined if, if their quarry is other birds. So those falconers that hunt maybe partridge or, or pheasants and such like, they're, they're, you, know, you, you can't hunt other birds because you're likely to transport it in. We've had to put in obviously biosecurity at the centre. There's now a Vercon S foot bath. Every time we walk back into the centre itself from the flying fields, we're having to you know at least disinfect our feet. Um, we've rested a lot of our birds to be quite honest to keep them indoors because we're not allowed to put them out. So in the centre, the majority of the birds there now live in aviaries in what we you and I would call free lofted. But we still have a number of our working birds that are tethered. And of course, what tethering gives you to a working bird is the ability to micromanage their health care and their lives. And of course, we can put them out in a lovely sunny spot in the morning. If it gets too hot, we can move them into the shade. We can give them a bath while they're in the sunshine. They often won't bathe if they're inside their muse in a shady spot. They want that sunshine and they have a good bath. Um, we're not able to put those birds out and tether them out anymore because the wording is the birds have got to be kept indoors until this epidemic of bird flu passes. So yes, it has impacted. It's impacted on what we can do with the birds. It's given us a lot more work um, because if you're keeping the birds in all the time, there's more muck in, in the housing rather than out and we can move them around on a weathering lawn. And initially it kind of just made us think unbelievable. We can just bring guests in, but now we can't run the business for another reason. That's been negated. But of course, we're in lockdown again, so none of that matters whatsoever <laughs> from a business point of view. Dave Sharp of Icarus Falconry and Raptor Exotics. <laughs> Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel.